All right. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you may be tuning in from. Thank you so much for joining us for another hashtag together at home uh, from Buffet Crampon, your weekly source of fun, exciting wind instrument manufacturing news and Q&A interviews. Uh, as is always, my name is Declan Lynch, and I am the low brass product specialist here at Buffet Crampon USA. And I am joined by not one, but two very, very exciting guests this week, uh, two very, very prominent artists within the Mino, Melton Mino Weston family. Uh, please welcome John DeCesar of the Seattle Symphony and Craig Knox of the Pittsburgh Symphony, both the principal tubists, if I didn't say that before. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks for, for having us. us. Uh, and before we dive into this, I want to give a quick little couple updates to everybody that tunes into this lovely weekly show. Uh, as you know, we have put on this show for about a, almost a, a little over a year now since the pandemic started. And normally we had been broadcasting this 2 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays, but that has changed. It is still on Thursdays, as you can clearly tell. However, we are doing it now at 6 p.m. Eastern right here on the Buffet Crampon New York showroom page. That's right, the New York showroom page, not the Buffet page, not the Mount Weston page, and certainly not the BNS page, the New York showroom page. So please make sure that you check back here frequently for any updates for future webcasts. And if you are entering the situation where you miss an opportunity to see this good webcast, we house these on our YouTube page, Buffet Crampon Rhapsody Live, where you can see any of the fantastic interviews we have done in the past with our amazing artists. So uh, again, quick reminder, Buffet Crampon Rhapsody Live on YouTube. So make sure you check that out and uh, see some of the really cool information from many of our artists. So again, thank you uh, both so much for being here. Anybody that is tuning in, uh, make sure that you shout, tell us where you are in the comment section. Let us know if you have any comments or questions or just want to say hi. Um, so again, thank you both so much for being here. And I'm going to shut up talking in a second, but usually we start off these interviews by talking about what the guest or guests have been up to during the pandemic. But I think I'd like to change things up a little bit because we're starting to see the, the other side of these things. We're starting to see things get more open. Uh, travel is becoming much easier. Uh, the vaccination rollout in this country is going quite well. So I would like to see what both of you have been up to lately. Uh, I don't have, I don't want to play favorites. So whoever would like to go first, please, uh, let's go with Craig. Why not? Sure. Okay, great. Thanks again, Declan, for having us. And uh, yeah, I mean, after, after a long, you know, year and a half of the big pivot, you know, it's from all the performing um, activities, the normal performance calendar that, that John and I both have, I think. Um, I, I spent a lot of time um, teaching over this last year and a half, sort of delving into that a little bit more so as, as we figured out how to do it mm -hmm. online and virtually. And um, so, so it is nice to be transitioning back to um, a, a schedule that's more balanced with, with um, a lot more performance on the horizon. And um, here in Pittsburgh, I mean, we're just sort of starting to get to that point. We've had some um, small ensemble, brass ensemble, brass quintet performances that have been under the auspices of the, of the Pittsburgh Symphony over the last couple months. But um, actually this weekend will be our first full orchestra performances for the 4th of July weekend. So um, really looking forward to just getting back with the entire band and, and you know playing all the, the music that we always play this time of year. And we have some more, uh, several, I think we have four weeks of outdoor concerts that they've scheduled for us in, um, in August. And then we, we're back to our full, um, a full season next year. Um, you know, as I'm seeing from most of the orchestras, you know, it's looking really good and, you know, hopefully everything holds and we're able to, to, um, to get back. But, you know, they announced our, our calendar and it's, we've got Bruckner symphonies and Mahler symphonies and Tchaikovsky symphonies and Heldenleben and all sorts of great stuff next, next year, you know, so it's really, it's just gonna be amazing, of course. Um, so I'm starting to gear up for that, um, I mean, I've been playing a lot over this, uh, you know, using the practice time, the extra practice time. It's not that I haven't been playing, but it's going to be great to um, play with friends. And um, and then I guess the other thing that I have coming up immediately in the near future is in August, I'm going back to the Grand Teton Music Festival in, in Jackson, Wyoming, where I've been spending part of my summer for the last 25 years um, up until last year um, mm -hmm. when, you know, they had to... to um, they canceled that that season last year, but um, again, that'll be full orchestra, 
you know, musicians from orchestras all over the country, um, you know, who come and join us for that festival there. And we're doing Tchaikovsky symphonies and, um, you know, big, big pieces um, that I'm looking forward to playing this summer. Strauss. Tone You're coming back with a bang is what, is what I'm hearing. It's, it's yeah. really making a splash. That's awesome. Yeah. It's looking good. That's awesome. And, and so I'm really glad to hear it, especially with the, the live music returning. Um, but John, so what have you been up to? I know you actually have been playing live music recently. Yeah, I did. I recently had the chance last week to play the Plow Concerto with the Seattle Symphony. Uh, it was so much fun. And it was so it was so unique to just go like the first that was one of the first times I played with the symphony. I played a couple operas in Benaroya, but this was the first time it was the first time I've played for an audience in, oh, my gosh, since March 2020. So however long that's been. So the first time playing for an audience, I walk out to play concerto. It was definitely a, a weird feeling, <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was really great. It was just so nice. And just to hear the applause and people people really liked it. And it was just, it was nice to do that. And it was, and I'm really lucky that it was able to be live streamed so people could watch it all over. You know, my parents were able to see it and stuff like that. So that was, that was really, really nice. So that was, that was last week, but before then I hadn't played very much with the orchestra. We, we did total tubist and we taught, like Craig was saying, we taught, I taught so much, did a lot more zoom teaching, picked up a lot of students and it was really nice. It really kept me motivated and kept me, kept me working on things. You know, we didn't have, you didn't have the weekly orchestra calendar to keep you in in check kind of you know you were off on your own so that was very nice and the things coming up for me we have the seattle opera is doing divalcura outside at the seattle center so there's a nice amphitheater there this summer and the end of august so we're going to do that opera which i'm really looking forward to i'm going to use my uh my fafner b flat tuba i'm going to look forward to using that right. yeah and that'll be that'll be really that'll be really fun and then we have a full full calendar just it, if you looked at our season you would have never thought anything happened with Mahler 6 and Shostakovich 11 and a lot of highlights in there so I'm really really looking forward to getting back to just the everyday you know every week grind and playing with my my colleagues will be amazing that's awesome um and it, again it's it's so good and, and awesome to hear that not only is our things coming back but big things are coming back with, with Mahler 6 and, and really big works like that and uh, my wonderful producer, Warren, will be putting some of the, the links, uh, like the link to the, uh, the uh, live stream uh, for Plow and then different websites and things like that. So for everybody in the chat, I get ready to get bombarded with links like that to check out. So, um, so awesome. one thing I'd like to, if I, I'd like to just interject one little thing, the Plow, Go. I believe ex expires. They only leave it up for one week. So I think today might be the last day. So if you post the link and you want to watch it, you probably, probably should do that soon. That's all I have Make to sure say. You do it then. You have to do that. <laughs> we already have somebody in the comments saying the uh, David Topping, the plow was spectacular. Really thank was you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, jumping right into it, obviously, uh, for everybody tuning in, the title is relatively self-explanatory, not because I am joined by two total tubists, but because they have put on an amazing opportunity to become a total tubist. Um, so for those that aren't aware, uh, back in December, uh, the two of these fine gentlemen put together a really, really cool educational program called the Total Tubist that offers people the opportunity to better themselves as tuba players. Um, and at the time, things were still uh, somewhat up in the air in terms of how people were teaching over Zoom and these difficulties, but this was a really cool opportunity uh, that I saw a lot of people jump into and who heard only amazing things. And so I wanted to invite them both on to talk about these things and, and what started and its creation and, and what went in, into it and everything. So I don't want, I don't know who, who wants to start or maybe whose idea it officially was or anything like that, but really what started this, uh, this idea to be, to create the total tubist. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start if you don't mind, Craig. Um, sure. I, I've seen, I'd seen these little online programs go up and I'm like, gosh, that's such a good idea. And it's, because everybody, all my students were starving for something to do, and everybody was just kind of in the same rut. There's no auditions, there's nothing going on, you know. So I called Craig in the fall, and I just said, what do you think about doing this together? You know, because I, I didn't want to do too much by myself, because it would have been really busy. I was like, what if we split it, it might, you know, lighten the load, and it would be really nice to have two different ideas and then the other part and the reason why I asked Craig is I studied with Craig and we, we have very similar, you know, I learned how to play the tuba pretty much from, from him and, so, and one of his old students as well. So there's the lineage is perfect there. So I was like, this is going to, this could really work. And we expected it to go fairly well, but we didn't expect to get as many students as we ended up having. And it was just, 
it was great. And we built this community. I think I'm most proud of the community really, because we had 55 ish people. It depended on the month. We had a lot of people and the community on Facebook was just fantastic. And people would post videos and ask questions and they could build a, we built a little, it felt like a little college studio almost, you know, it was large obviously, but it, that's what it felt like. And that was, it ended up being great. And we did about 11 classes a month and we had guest artists. We had, you know, Chris Olka and Seth Horner. And it was great to have all those people come in and yeah. So I'd love to hear what Craig has to say about it. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was John's idea. He called me up and, um, and said, you know, what do you think about doing a course? And I, I mean, I immediately jumped on it because I have to tell you, I mean, this was something that has sort of been spinning around in my head for years. Cause I mean, I've been teaching for a long time, you know, I mean, um, at, um, primarily at the college level. And I teach now at Carnegie Mellon university and at the Curtis Institute where I, where I studied and, um, you know, I've really I feel like over the years and after working with so many students, I've really sort of put together a a, a core program of, th you know, of of, you know, fundamentals and of, of key elements um, to to, you know, how to develop and um, to orchestra repertoire and, and you know, and all, all of the material that, you know, that you need to and sort of come up with some shortcuts and and some things that I really sort of feel strongly about and that I really um, have found can be really helpful for for students and um, sort of boiled that down to you know something that is pretty you know efficient in terms of of how well it works and so I I've I've been thinking about that for a long time how to you know use that in the most productive effective way using all the technology that we have these days you know whether it's videos or or some kind of online delivery or something you know so uh, to make the most out of out of that. And so when, when he brought this idea up, I thought that's perfect, you know, um, and because this is the time when, you know, it's re there's a real need for it too. It's not like we're going to have to, you know, necessarily beg people uh, to try to try us out because people are really, you know, sort of floundering a little bit at that time, you know? And um, so it seemed like it, it was something that, um, you know, we felt strongly about, you know, that we that we had to offer, but that also um, was something that could really fit an important, um, fill an important need at this time. And so, um, as John said, I mean, uh, it really exceeded our expectation in terms of the response, you know, and it was great. We had, as he said, about 55 people in any given month. Um, it changed a little bit from month to month. Most people stayed through the whole period, which was five months of, of um of content, you know, and several sessions, usually I think three, three sessions, three or more sessions a week um, on all sorts of topics and um, people from all over the world. I mean, we had people from, I think four continents. Is that right, John? Um, the, my, by my last count. Um, and so there was a lot of, a lot of sharing and, con you know, sh and, and uh, two way contributions, you know, from the, from the participants as well. It wasn't just us sort of um, dumping out, you know, what we had to say, you know, there was a lot of back and forth and, and, um, and people sharing ideas and, and working through things together and asking for feedback, not just from us, but, you know, once they got to know the other participants, you know, um, sharing ideas and, and um, it was just a really, it was really great to see how well everybody worked together. That's awesome. And you mentioned the, the the part about the floundering aspect of the of, of the timing of it. Uh, it seemed like at that time, people had kind of figured out how to do the digital learning as experience. You know how to do Zoom lessons and things like that. But I, I still feel like there was this stigma around it where it was like, well, is it you know is it really gonna are they gonna hear everything or they not? You know what was the you know what was the learning curve with that like? You know how was the how did the technological hurdle, let's say, like impact any of this? Was that, or was that the easier part of it, all of this? I would say that was, for me, that was the easier part. Cause like, as you said, by then we had been doing, you know, for the better part of a year, you know, I had been teaching at my other schools um, mm -hmm. in large part um, online. And so, I mean, I, you know, I had the setup, I had, you know, um, I was used to that. The students were used to that. So that didn't, that didn't um, cause an issue for me. Um, the, the challenge for me as a teacher was, you know, in a, in one-on-one -on -one teaching, which we're used to doing, we're used to being in a room with one student at a time, or maybe a master class. but, um, 
you know, even in a master class, there's a lot of give and take and, you know, you're sort of responding in the moment. It's very spontaneous depending on what is needed by that particular student. Um, and then, and then you sort of, you just, you go with that. But when we're, when we have, you know, 50 or more students all at once who are all looking at you, you know, at one time, you know, it, you can't just be talking to each one of them and addressing their individual needs. So you have to try to anticipate, you know, how to put together an hour or an hour and a half or as John knows, my, my classes seem to always go really long. <laughs> you know, maybe it's two hours of, of uh, discussion uh, and work on a certain piece of repertoire or a certain concept. And, and if you're not talking and delivering something, then, you know, there's, there's crickets, you know, there's nothing happening. So, you know, you really have to send, you know, prepare your material and, and, um, and have this sort of this seminar essentially ready to go. And also in terms of demonstration, you know, I mean, we, John and I, I think both really wanted to be demonstrating as much as possible. We think we thought that was a big part of the draw is that we're both, you know, full-time performers on the world stage. That's what mm -hmm. we do. And, you know, and so we felt like that's some part of what we should be offering is, is a, a glimpse of that. And so, I mean, we were, we were both working our butts off, you know, practicing, um, this material to, you know, to, to, um, to demonstrate and to, um, you know, to give as an example for the students. So it was, it was hard work, um, putting those, putting those classes together mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. I would say that that you said that perfectly, that was the hardest part and that teaching online wasn't, wasn't really an issue, but just it, you had to be so organized because Craig said it so perfectly when you're teaching a master class or one-on-one, -on -one, it's a, just you're kind of improvising at all times because you don't know what the student's going to sound like and then what they might need to work on. You can't go in there with a specific plan because then they, they might not do that thing, you know, so you have to constantly adjust. So it's more on the fly. I don't want to say winging it, but it's kind of like you're just on the fly doing it versus these classes that you had to be very prepared or else it, it felt really uncomfortable and you were, you know, scrambling to find things um, because there just wasn't that interaction. They were muted the whole time and they would ask, we would get tons of great, really great questions usually. So that, that helped things a lot um, when, when they ask, when they ask questions, but I've practiced a lot. I think I practice maybe more for total tubus than I do sometimes at work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I got to play John Williams tuba concerto now for, you know, a bunch of really, really accomplished, fantastic students. I mean, we had some, just some amazing players. So it was just, okay, I got to, I can't, can't mess around with this too much. <laughs> Well, that's one of the, you know, in, in doing the research for this, that was one of the, the things that I was reminded of is all of the different topics that were, were included uh, within the program. You know, I saw, you know, Vaughn Williams and the John Williams and every single specific really important piece. And then, you know, but then you expand that into, well, every single really important excerpt. And then you even, you know, but then that entails three or four or five different more things. So when planning that kind of curriculum, you know, how did you you know, where did you have to like draw the line or, or how did that process go? You know, was it, was there, was it originally like, we, we should talk about excerpts, but then I was like, well, we gotta do solos too. And what about this? You know, how do you kind of figure out what you want to do without kind of inflating it too much maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we wanted it to be the total tubus, you know, so it wasn't <laughs> just, you know, excerpts and it wasn't just this or that. I mean, we, and, and uh, you know, I think if anything, we had more material, you know, that that we could possibly, you know, the, the ideas that John and I had when we were brainstorming, you know, I mean, there's endless things that we could have done, you know, so if anything, it was like, how do we cut this down, you know, but I mean, we really did want it to be comprehensive, you know, so we had fundamentals classes, a lot of fundamentals classes that we just kept, you know, um, you know, kept, kept uh, reinforcing throughout the entire time. But um, then we had classes on uh, a series, you know, a series of classes on excerpts, a series of classes on solo repertoire. And then we had a series of um, special topics, things like maybe it could be on breathing or on taking auditions or on dealing with performance anxiety, um, you know, things like that. And then we had guests who came in and did um, their own presentations and, and um, joined us for some of our other classes. Um, I don't know, John, anything else you wanna sort of say about how we put that together? To. No, it was we we were brains, you know, we were talking about every possible thing. And then we, we did have to, we did have to uh, slim it down a little bit because it was there were so many classes, but we wanted to try to keep it as comprehensive as possible and as 
you know, I think we had two specific topic classes. We had two, and luckily, you know, since there's two of us, we could do like one a piece. You know, he did, he would do an extra class, and I would do an extra class. A solo, I would do a solo. You know, a fundamental topic, another fundamental topic. So it was really, it, I felt like it was very balanced actually in the long run. It was a lot of content, uh, but it was balanced on what we what we did. And we we had a Q and A every month to check in, and people would ask, you know, if any questions about the month prior, or if anybody new joined that month, they could ask questions about the program or anything. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought I, th I was actually really happy with how we structured it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, and I really just kind of again viewing it all again, I was just so reminded of everything that was going on and, and how cool it, uh, you know, the whole package was. Um, but for highlights, you know, as, because uh, as a tuba player and as a student somewhat recently, you know, I never really saw an opportunity like this or something that was so comprehensive or, you know, even, even down to some of the, some of the different camps that are out there, there was nothing that was so laser focused on, on tuba playing and, and this aspect. So what were the highlights and is this something, okay, I'll, Two questions. A, a highlight from each of you, and then is there any kind of plan to take this into a, you know, into an a, a, uh, in-person kind of a situation where there could be the total tubist camp or anything like that? You know, is that something you guys have, have thought about before? Let's see. I mean, there are many highlights. I mean, one highlight for me, I guess, would be um, the, the mock audition that we had in the last month. And because it was sort of, it felt to me like a little bit of a culmination of everything that we had been leading up to in a lot of ways, because it addressed, you know, some, a lot of the specific repertoire. In fact, I think everything on that audition list that we put together, which was pretty big, we had, I think we had covered all that material during the course of, of the, of the program. Um, and then a lot of the, the things that we had talked about um, in some of the special topics classes, you know, dealt with how to put your best performance forward, you know, in a, in a tough situation, in a high pressure situation like an audition, you know, and how to perform at your best and all the, the fundamental, you know, aspects of playing, but also performing that, you know, help you achieve success like that. So it was great to get participation from a lot of our students through several rounds and be able to give them, give them a chance to show what they had learned during the course of the five months and then also give them some feedback, you know, through throughout um, that hopefully is helpful for them going forward. So I, I like that. And we had Colin Williams um, trombonist with the New York Philharmonic mm -hmm. who was in like as a guest on our panel, you know, to give sort of a different. Oh, a that's different so angle, cool. You know, that I think they really appreciated. And, and even for those who weren't um, playing, you know, who didn't either didn't um, didn't submit an audition or hadn't made it to that round, you know, they, they could hear his, his comments and his feedback and his take on the whole thing, which I think was helpful for everybody. So anyway, that was a highlight. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I'll let John take it from, you know, I'll let John pick it up from here. We've been talking about like, what's, what's next. And we're, I think we're sort of waiting a little bit to see again, like what, how would we best fit something in because now things are really different, you know? So everyone's going back to school. Everyone's going back to, their regular calendar and um, you know so we've got to figure out if there's a way that we can keep up with this momentum I mean it would be great to to you know take it to wherever the next logical place is but in a way that fits into the, mm -hmm. the new situation yeah yeah for sure yeah it's good we we've, we've talked about this a, a bit on what to do you know do we do a summer thing do we do something in the fall but we just with the orchestras going back to, and Craig's teaching so much, teaching in Philadelphia and teaching at Carnegie Mellon, I'm teaching at University of Washington and just just make sure we don't, we wanna do a really good job. I think that was one thing I wanted to make sure we we did a we did the students right by, you know, we had all this time, we wanted to plan this to, to be a really good experience for everybody and not, you know, so I, I wanna make sure we get a, I think we both need to get an idea of what our time looks like before we can plan anything. But I think I think I would love something in person I think that would be great. We we sent a little survey out at the end, and people filled it out, and a lot of people seemed very receptive to an to an in person camp or something. So I think that would be that would be great. We just have to find the time. It's we're, it's, we're both busy. It's hard. It's, really <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's tough. You're not, you're and the not most at home with nothing to do for extended periods of time. So. <laughs> Please no more. <laughs> give me give me back give me back to work. I, I, I can't I can't do this for much longer. <laughs> 
Oh, I was, oh, sorry, the highlight. I forgot about the first part of the, the, uh, the mock audition was the was the highlight for me because people would submit videos. We do an excerpt, you know, like an early one was we tried to put some heavy ones up front, like Meister Singer, and people would submit a video. And then five months later, I heard the same person do Meister Singer on their submission. And it was night and day, totally different. And just so, the improvement was every single person that submitted. I think just hearing that improvement was uh, it was it was really it was really nice as a teacher you know it's just they really and since we covered you know audition preparation and you know what to do when you're nervous and every excerpt it was a lot of people put really great products together for that final that final mock audition and that was really yeah i think that that was definitely my highlight as well that's awesome it's i i imagine it's difficult as as somebody who teaches younger kids on the side it, it's Seeing a little bit is, is very nice, but I'm sure seeing something as polished as, as you know, a really cool exit like that is, is even that more rewarding. So that's, that's awesome. And for anybody tuning in, remember, we're here to put your questions in now, because once, we, once we're offline, you'll never be, a, be able to ask a single question again. Just, just kidding. But again, put in a couple questions, but if there's anything you guys wanna ask afterwards, you know, we'll, we'll put this up on YouTube and we'll make sure that we get your, your questions answered. Um, and now, as we're starting to run out of time, I wanted to highlight a bit on these bad boys of what you guys actually wake up and play every day. So yeah. I know, as, as uh, John mentioned, you guys have a very close relationship in terms of teacher and student. And of course, you put on this amazing program together. Um, but you both have relatively similar setups in terms of, of equipment, uh, being a, pretty much a bare 2250 and, and Fosner setup, it looks like, for the most part. So for, for two guys that do a similar job, but on totally different parts of the country, how do you, what is it about that, that combo that works best for both of you? Yeah, yeah that's Great. true. We have the same, we have the same stable, don't we, John? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think I was one of the first, you know, people to buy a bear when they, when they were available, you know, in that first shipment, they came over. Um, I tried Allen's um, in, in Lincoln Center. We were, we were on tour with the PSO um, playing at Carnegie, I think. And I, I met him and, and and had a chance to play his um you know the one that he that he was playing at the time which was um you know at the very beginning and um i i was playing a nurshal at the time and that's the the instrument that i won the position on in the pso um but i was looking for something that's that had that fullness of sound but a, like a little bit more clarity and um, a little bit more precision and a little bit more ease of play, really, um, and more efficiency. And so I just thought that instrument just, you know, fit all those um, criteria. And so I've been playing that ever since um, for probably almost 15 years. Um, and, um, and I remember when I tried the 2250, I tried that in the showroom in Gerritsried, uh, Germany, outside of Munich, when we were on tour um, in Germany. And um, I just immediately, I, I have to have this horn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, because, um, you know, I had been looking for so long for an F tuba, you know, that, that, you know, I could play down below the staff in and out up and down, you know, without feeling like I was going into another universe, you know, and, and just put the whole register together, you know, and, um, and with a big sound and, and placed, you know, solo material and orchestral repertoire. And it's, I, I love that horn. And, um, and then the Fafner also the B flat for me was sort of a discovery again in Germany. Um, and actually this was in Vienna in, in, um, in, in uh, Austria, um, uh, getting together with uh, Paul Halvax, um, who you know is the tuba player in the Vienna Philharmonic, and they play B flats all the time, B flats and F. And um, hearing what he sounded on his very very special um, custom made Fafner, but oh yeah, um, and having a chance to play that horn and the other ones in uh, in the Garrett's Garrett's free shop, and um, and just getting a sense for the bigger, wider, heavier you know, kind of girth that the, that instrument has. It doesn't quite have the same kind of, you know, punctuation that we're used to on the C tuba, but mm -hmm. it has the width and the breadth, you know, that sometimes in Shostakovich or Prokofiev or, um, you know, that kind of material, it's just, it really changes things. And um, so, yeah, those are my three main instruments. Although I also a few years ago bought an Ursus, the yeah. four quarter size C tuba that Alan Bear designed. And that's a great pair with the, um, 
with the with the bear and it's great for me i use it in the quintet in the center city brass quintet and and in the quintet when we play here in pittsburgh with pso quintet um and on some solo repertoire when i play c tuba and that's a great i love i love a four quarter size c tuba I just, yeah i mean i love that it's so much fun yeah yeah that's fantastic i luckily craig did all the leg work and tried <laughs> out all these instruments <laughs> no i i used to play a, a granite's pck i had that when i won my job with the louisville orchestra when i was studying with craig it was a great tuba it's but when I picked up the bear, every time I would play it, uh, I played a friend of mine's, you know, here and there, and it just had, it had an extra width to it, but it kept the, it kept the clarity, and it was just, they're just really easy to play. It doesn't feel like you're playing a really big tuba. It doesn't, it doesn't respond like that. It's, it's, it's almost like you're driving a really big sports car in a sense. Like it, it plays, it plays like it's smaller, and I think that's why I like it so much. It doesn't feel cumbersome at all, which, but it, it provides a really, just fantastic foundation for the brass section and I, I love all the overtones that it creates um the 2250 same experience i had an old rotor uh f tuba from the 80s before and it was just the low register was just it felt like a different place and then the 2250 it's just and the the, the blow is so similar to the bear too it's really nice like i can i can switch back and forth and i don't feel like i, I have to change anything you know that the tuba just does it what i want it to do without me having to manipulate my airstream or my embouchure now i'm playing in this register it's just like i'm just playing and then when i played the i wasn't planning on buying the fofner but i found one for a really good price it was piston and i was like, oh I'll, I'll get it it was my first year in the orchestra and it's just so much fun and i take it to work and everybody likes it because the sound is the sound is massive but it's still clear it's yeah. it's just like it's just this big column of sound and i really it's yeah it's 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 a lot of fun to play i don't get to use it all the time you know it's just mm -hmm. it i I stick out a little bit more with it because it's a little louder. <laughs> so I, I have to be careful. You know, it's a, but Shostakovich and some, we did Coffee F7 and that was just perfect. It was such a, such a great sound. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever, uh, with the, the emphasis of C tuba in this country, anytime I have people to, to champion the Faulkner, I really make sure that I, I get that out of here. Now I have two. So it's amazing. <laughs> so thank you both for that. Um, and before we, before we sign off, uh, well, Chris Coppinger, our, one of our division managers up in the Northeast, is saying hey so, to both of you. So thanks yeah, for great. tuning Hi, Chris. in. And uh, before we sign off, um, is there any piece of wisdom from two of the total tubists that I have in front of me that you can offer to our to our uh, our audience going forward? Wow. That's yeah. a big, that's <laughs> no, a... I'm sorry. I like to try and end some of them with something, you know, maybe inspiring or philosophical and now i have the the total tube is here to to inspire all of our viewers so i wanted to take advantage of that too wow well uh, i mean geez i don't even know where to begin but i mean one thing i would say i mean just talking about tubas like we just were and you know tying 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 in what john and i i think both were expressing when we were talking about um why we gravitate towards the, the instruments that we play you know it has so much to do with sound you know and i mean you know, we need to talk, everybody, you know, everyone listening, we need to talk about musicianship for sure. And that's, you know, that's what it's all going to come down to is your musicianship and that we really stress that in the total tubas. But um, if you're just looking for like a little nugget that sort of relates to what we've been talking about, I mean, one one thing I would say is just, you know, in terms of sound, you know, you just you, you want to try to to um, find you know the the best most resonant sound that you can that you can produce on any whatever instrument you're playing um you know with the that that you can produce with the least amount of effort you want to try to avoid um you know sort of fighting against fighting against the instrument and and pushing it pushing it too hard or muscling it too much or uh you know contorting or or uh you know getting getting overly um concerned about you know, trying to position yourself in a certain way when you're playing the instrument and try to, you know, try to try to accept the feedback that you're getting from the instrument um, and find that perfect balance balancing point or what I call the sweet spot, you know, in the sound on every single note. And just you can look for that on every single note. And basically what I something I tell my students is, you know, if you play a whole passage or a whole piece, you know, if someone were to do a freeze frame, and just like take a tiny slice out of any given note that you're playing anywhere in the piece, you know, you want that to just sound gorgeous. You know, you want it to be a beautiful, 
rich resonant sound you know at any given point so if you're ever struggling to try to figure out you know how to fix this how do i make this sound better or what do i focus on as i'm playing this you know you can really just follow the sound you know and and try to try to find a find a note any note on any instrument that you play that you're where you're really happy with the sound and then just take that and try to spread that throughout the entire register of the instrument and through any piece that you're playing and that's you know that's really the shortcut to sounding good all the time that's great advice that's awesome advice it's very good (laughs) oh geez uh i would just say stay stay inspired and find the things that will you know help you like the total tubist or watching a webcast like this or taking a zoom lesson i think the one thing that's been nice is that zoom has opened up it's kind of broken down borders and opened up different avenues. You know, you don't, before you'd have to fly somewhere to take a lesson with somebody or drive or, you know, but now it's just, yeah, just try to soak up as much information as you can and try to stay inspired. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and for the words of wisdom and for your time today. I really hope all of our, everybody tuning in right now has really enjoyed this as much as I have, because this has been, one of the ones that I've really looked forward to uh, for quite a while because I've, I've been really looking forward to hear a little bit more about the insights of the program and, and what you both have been up to and all the hard work that's gone into it. So thank you so thank you both so much for being here. And hey, thanks for having us. One last reminder and plug to everybody tuning in that we will be back here again next Thursday at the same time. Yes, 6 p.m. the same time. And our our amazing uh, one of our direct specialists direct sales specialist at Powell Flutes, Kristen Moore, will be sitting down with one of the fantastic Powell artists to talk about head joint discovery, what you want to find in a head joint, whether it's different materials or different uh, cuts or anything like that. I don't know much about them. I'm the tuba guy here, not the flute guy. So I'll let Kristen talk about all that, but make sure you're here to hear it next Thursday on the New York showroom page at 6 p.m. So thank you everybody tuning in. Thank you both for being here. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks, Declan.